All right, I am so excited for this panel today. Uh, I, I, I came up with the title for this panel of Having Space in the Fund, which is my favorite pun of TechCrunch Disrupt San Francisco 2018. Um, today we're going to talk about space. Uh, it's not the final frontier. VCs are investing every single day into multiple companies, and we have some of the most qualified people in Silicon Valley today on stage. Um, Tess, I want to start with you. You wrote on TechCrunch um, an essay about sort of the space market and some of your thoughts here, and I wanted to ask, why is space an investable area today? Yeah, this article you mentioned is titled Space is Open for Business. And it goes into how the ecosystem has evolved from these massive school bus sized satellites in geostationary orbit, which is 35,000 kilometers around the equator, to these small CubeSats, which are tissue box sized satellites in low Earth orbit, which is 500 to 1,200 kilometers. And this invention of the CubeSat form factor, people can throw commercial off-the-shelf sensors, whether it's Earth observation or communication sensors, and distribute them via constellation around the world and provide ubiquitous coverage of the Earth or communication of the Earth. And this essay, Space is Open for Business, really shows the, the space stack and the ecosystem now of space companies focused on various parts of this fragmented ecosystem to support one another. Rob, why is space an investable area for you today? Well, when you take a look at the area, I, I started in the space industry a long time ago. So when you talk about the school buses out in geostationary orbit, I worked on one of the first A2100 spacecraft. Oh. And it's pretty telling for existing, the existing space industry that that platform is still being built today. So when you look at typical incumbent behavior, it's very similar. They're building a lot of the same stuff they built before. But in that 25 years, we've had 25 years of Moore's Law, and we've had all the stuff that's happened with the smartphone. So when you take a look at all the sensors and computation and communications protocols that now can fit into a cell phone that were the size of a school bus before, it opens up a whole new area. So when you look at the most interesting areas for investment, they're ones that tend to be enabled by Moore's Law, because if you have a business model that's just starting to work now, it's going to get 2x better every 18 months. Absolutely. And Matt, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd have to uh, agree with both Rob and Tess. Uh, I think one of the nuances of the Moore's Law um, uh, forcing function is that space is, is not a point problem. So you can have the most sophisticated satellite in the world, whether it's the size of this bottle of water or the size of a bus, but they're generating massive amounts of data. And so you need Moore's Law uh, improvements in downlink and the ability to transmit data down from space, which have happened exponentially. You need things that look like AWS and Google Compute and Azure to be able to store and process, especially for AI and machine learning algorithms, the massive amounts of data to get any signal out of it. And so when we look at a, uh, a space company, whether it's, it's Planet Labs or we're an anchor, uh, or Jupiter Intelligence, which, for example, does um, real-time climate uh, risk prediction out to 50 years in the future, we look at whether they've solved a the distributed problem. If the improvements that, uh, that Rob talks about and that Tess talks about hasn't happened, none of those companies would be possible. What excites us is at the pace of innovation, what happens five years out from now? And when we ask you, what are some of the key kind of enabling technologies in this space? I mean, is it like sort of these science projects coming out of the universities? Or are there other startups that are sort of creating the infrastructure for space that's allowing them to grow? Well, in general, a lot of it is around the sensing technologies and the communications technologies. So I come back to Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. It's really mainstream. It's not just the universities, but it's places like Qualcomm. It's the mm -hmm. people that are building the chipsets and the people that are making the processors that are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the other thing that's happening is there's this virtuous cycle, which is the reason that spacecraft are out in what's called geostationary orbit mm -hmm. is because it would revolve around the Earth once a day. Mm -hmm. But it's a long ways out there. And it's outside the radiation belts of the US, or excuse me, of, of the world, so they're not protected. Mm -hmm. So when you get into low Earth orbit, which is just above the atmosphere, you find that all of those components are still protected, 
by the Earth's magnetic field. So you can use off-the-shelf components. So there are all these things that are coming together to make it possible, and a lot of it has to do with commercial breakthroughs as much as anything you'd find in a university. Yeah, I think there are two specific events or inventions that have really catalyzed and brought in momentum to the new space ecosystem or space 2.0. The first is the invention of the CubeSat, which, like Matt said, could be the size of a water bottle. And once this was established, these sensors you can throw into this CubeSat, there wasn't really a way to get them to their designated orbit in low Earth orbit. I was a mission manager at SpaceX, and I would see tech secondary and tertiary payloads be bumped from mission to mission because our focus was the primary. So the second invention or event was the invention of the low Earth orbit launch vehicle. And Matt and I are involved and invested in a company called Rocket Lab, which really has democratized access for these small satellites to get to their perfect orbit in low Earth orbit. And then based off of those two trends, looking for, for future events, whether it's manufacturing in space or mining in space or space tourism, now that space really is democratized and the bottleneck of launch, which really was restricting the entire industry from moving forward, has been opened. Uh, I tend to uh, look at something that's a little bit unglamorous, but does get back actually to this Moore's Law um, positive gradient, which is simulation and engineering software. So two quiet revolutions have happened over the last 20 years. The, the cost of simulating complex aerospace projects, whether they're supersonic aircraft like uh, a Boom is building or uh, more than supersonic rockets like Rocket is building, the engine components, whether these consumer grade uh, electronics can survive complex multi-dimensional EM fields, 20 years ago, that would have cost something on the order of 30 or 40 million dollars of supercompute or baby supercompute hardware from proprietary manufacturers, and you would have had to get a license from somebody like Dassault for another multiple, multiple millions of dollars. And then a tiny handful of engineers would be able to use it. The, the essentially advent of elastic supercompute uh, actually, one of, uh, uh, one of our companies, Rescale, offers this in conjunction with, with cheaper simulation. Um, and open source simulation software has meant that four young women from University of Birmingham can wake up, decide that they hate their PhD supervisor, and attack an incredibly <laughs> complex aerospace project. And that democratization of... Uh, of the ability to do rigorous engineering and moreover to do fast turns. 20 years ago, you couldn't iterate, as, as Rob uh, uh, would tell you, iterate equals getting fired. Um, also means that you can do this remarkably inexpensively and stage your progress out in a way that is amenable to venture financing which I think addresses... Well, and I think uh, that that's the next question. I mean, all three of you work at, at very prestigious uh, venture firms. How do, how do you think about it as an investable category, and not just from you know, raising capital and finding follow-ons, but also from the exit perspective? I mean, it's a very... Space has not had a lot of exits. There's some very valuable companies like SpaceX that are, um, what, uh, uh, almost nine uh, you know, figures in valuation, but you know, how do you... Or ten figures in valuation. How do you, how do you think about that? Well, really quickly, when you look at SpaceX, from what I understand, they have very significant revenue, somewhat predictable revenue, and they've just chosen not to go public for a variety of reasons. There's actually a fair amount of liquidity if you're in SpaceX and you want to get out mm -hmm. and the other way around. So I would say that's a, a, a great example. As far as investment, I always find it funny how people talk about areas like this and they talk about how capital intensive it is, and then they turn around and invest in a SaaS company that takes 100 to 150 million to get to cash flow break even. So in terms of the capital that it really takes to get there, it's remarkably similar. You see it in startup after startup. The difference is you end up spending the money on different things and you may spend more of it up front. Mm -hmm. But once you have a rocket that works or once you have some sort of product that works, you have a very ready market that can scale without the sales force 
that you need to have for, say, an enterprise SaaS company. And let me ask, um, you know, when you think about the round structures, I mean, how do you get to, what, what does an MVP look like in space? I mean, it, particularly on the hardware side, you're trying to put a rocket into orbit or something like this. I mean, what, what does that mean for a Series A or a Series B? Like, what are, what are the milestones you kind of have to hit? Uh, I'll dive in if you don't want to immediately, Tess. Um, for, uh, for us, I would say that um, MVP for a satellite company is actually remarkably inexpensive. To both Tess and Rob's point, whether the sensors work, whether the data transmission uh, for the amounts of data being uh, uh, sub subject or produced by sensor fusion up in space can be delivered, um, whether storage and compute can be made in a compact enough form factor, you can actually test that on Earth and then rent uh, you know, an aging U2. And you know, the distance between you know, 30, <laughs> 30 miles up uh, uh, and, um, or 20 miles up and 200 miles up uh, isn't that much. Uh, if it's working from 20 miles up, it's probably going to work from 200 miles up, at least enough to spend uh, risk capital on it. So when we see that level of emerging technical credibility, uh, for example, as we did uh, with a company uh, we did with um, uh, Spark Capital called Capella. And Capella said, hey guys, we're going to build a synthetic aperture radar satellite that can see three meters into the ground anywhere on the planet, more or less in real time, build a constellation of them, and oh yeah, by the way, it's going to have insane resolution so you can even see metal fatigue happening in a bridge. And we said, that sounds good. Uh, <laughs> do you have any evidence for that? And they showed us the, um, they showed us the power amps and the radar architecture um, and some pretty convincing early data that said they could do this. And in fact, it was so persuasive that the Department of Defense wrote them a huge check even before they launched in anticipation of keeping an eye on bad guys like North Korea. So they're going to have to do, they're going to have to launch, they're going to have to do other yeah. stuff, but you can stage it. Wait, Tess, are yeah. you seeing the same patterns? Uh, well, back to the, yeah. the question regarding SpaceX still being a private yeah. contract yeah. company. And there has only been one space liquidation event, which is when Google acquired Skybox. We were early investors in Skybox. Uh, and now it's part of Planet Labs as, as Terra Bella. And other than Google acquiring Skybox, there have not been other space startups or any liquidation event in the industry. And I think the inflection point for there to be more movement will be once the space ecosystem expands beyond selling to one another. Right now we have rocket companies selling to satellite companies to launch their satellites and it's all within the space stack. And once it's opened to agriculture, oil and gas, other industries will see more liquidation events and exits in the space industry. Let me ask, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of founders in the room uh, and online. Um, what are the qualifications to do a rocket style, you know, a startup today? I mean, are, do you have to be a rocket scientist, so to speak? Is it helpful to have an agricultural background or, or a vertical background? I mean, what, what do you need today? Are, are the API, so to speak, strong enough to be able to just launch it if you know nothing? Well, I think one of the skills you really need to have on the team is mechanical engineering skills of some sort so that you understand the interaction between electrical engineering, civil engineering, you have vibrations when you're going up on a spacecraft. So you don't absolutely need to have it as the founder, but to have an understanding of it's important. Now, what's nice about space is that it's very logical. The challenge is that it's also weird at the same time because everything you think about in terms of your conventional everyday life, like how things heat and cool, et cetera, are colored by the fact that we live in an atmosphere. So when you pull it away, it's very easy to predict what it's going to be, but you have to take aside all the assumptions you have. So when you're building a team, you don't, you don't have to have an aerospace background, but you really should have at least somebody on your founding team or the initial team that really understands how orbital mechanics works and how the space environment works. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else want to take that? Uh, I, I would say actually, um, 
thanks to some of the stuff that we've all done up here on our sta uh, on stage and some of the companies that our, our peers have had the courage to invest in, we are tiptoeing towards a very rough approximation of AWS for space. Uh, Rocket Lab is chartered to launch every 72 hours. Um, there are a few people chasing it who may or may not be successful, but if they are, that just expands the market for getting into space remarkably cheaply. So we can envision a world where, you know, having the beginning or even a complete constellation of satellites is in the high single digit to low double digit millions of dollars, um, which is well within the eccentric billionaire range. <laughs> exactly. And it's getting, getting down to the grumpy early the eccentric stage, millionaire gr grumpy yeah, exactly. early stage VC range. Um, I, think you will, I think you will see this combination of fast, inexpensive launch of people leasing portions of their constellation um, and again of widespread distributed high performance compute on the ground uh, combining to enable more almost pure software companies that are selling to some of the customers that test cited agriculture, oil and gas. We already have companies like that and I, I, I know my, my colleagues do here. I, I think the, the inflection point is, is, is very close. The corollary of that is that, um, you know, at, at a certain point, momentum and success and revenue stand on their own. To Rob's point, SpaceX could be, uh, could be public tomorrow, um, you know, and I kind of think of, you know, investors sitting around a boardroom going, U.S. Steel will never buy those crazy Intel guys. There's no <laughs> um, Disruptive companies that are making a mark on their own don't look like no-brainer exit candidates mm -hmm. to the establishment, but to the people in the sausage factory, it looks like a future of, you know, uh, uh, a dominant uh, sausage oligopoly. <laughs> exactly. Let me ask you, when you look at your, your venture investments, I mean, are they mostly space infrastructure, it's called the AWS layer, or are they more on the application side, sort of collecting the data, using that data in industry? How do you, how do you think about, uh, Tess, maybe we'll start with you, uh, from Bessemer's perspective, I mean, are you on the infrastructure side, or are you thinking more on the applications, or both? Yeah, I think a healthy combination of the both. Uh, our investments are in Rocket Lab, so a low Earth orbit launch vehicle, yep. and Spire, a general purpose CubeSat constellation for, and this is where the, the services aspect, it's AIS for naval tracking, or ADSB for plane tracking, and GPS radio occultation for weather data, and a variety of other sensors. You can use this constellation of satellites. So while I do see it's important to have the hardware to get this information, it's also important to analyze the information coming down from the sensors as well. So vertically integrating and owning multiple parts of the stack. Yeah, what about you first? I, I'd say the industry is still nascent enough yeah. from a startup point of view that it's hard to specialize in one area. So I think a lot of people tend to have rifle shots in terms mm -hmm. of the areas that they like. So for us, we're also investors in Spire. We're investors in Vector Launch Systems, which is a low Earth orbit launch vehicle, very, very low cost. And then we're also investors in Axion, which is in space propulsion, which is a very different problem, very different approach yeah. that you can take. And oddly, it's actually very capital efficient to build a company doing that because the propulsion elements are so small. And then we also think communications is interesting. So I think it's hard as an investor to go in and say, I want to go long on Earth observation, taking pictures of the ground and do a portfolio of that right now. Yeah. And Mao, about you for DCVC? Uh, you know, we, we kind of look at stuff that has self-reinforcing sustainable advantage uh, that at its heart is driven by um, proprietary algorithms and unique access to data that ideally is embodied in the real world, whether it's a, a rocket or a prediction that a certain block of New York is going to be underwater. Um, we want life or death outcomes uh, because I like to joke, you know, we're, we're courageous cowards. Um, if you don't have a company that's selling an absolute must-have, um, 
uh, you don't know what your outcome will be. For example, $450 million was poured this morning into a Chinese fruit delivery company. That terrifies me. I don't know whether people want on-demand mangoes in five years. <laughs> But, but I, from Earth know, orbit, low Earth yeah, orbit. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we're co-investors with, with TESS and Rocket Lab. We're anchor investors in Planet, which is, has uh, 200 satellites, in, in part thanks to uh, uh, Bessemer's uh, investment in Capella, which, uh, not Capella, in um, Skybox. Uh, Skybox, losing track, which they acquired. <laughs> um, so that's the entire Earth every day. Um, uh, we're investors in Capella Space, the radar satellite constellation I mentioned, Akash, which does high bandwidth communications infrastructure. But on the other side, we're investors in Cape Analytics, which can score the insurance risk of any home in the United States from space in real time, in Jupiter Intelligence, uh, which can score the climate risk, flood, fire, wind, you name it, of a single block anywhere in the world from tomorrow out to 50 years, uh, and a couple of other stealth companies like that. So, you know, uh, uh, we think the pie always gets bigger, so actually we want to encourage our peers to invest along with us and to do more. We think there are opportunities on, you know, all sides of the table, and as Rob said, it's pretty early to, uh, to specialize. Now, obviously, do you were about to say? I was going to yeah, make a please. comment. It was interesting as, as we're mentioning the investments our firms have made, space investments, and, and Rob alluded to this, but the communications market being uh, really making Earth observations seem small, and none of us mentioned any of those, and I just want to note that I think that in the next term is the largest opportunity in the space ecosystem. is a constellation, and, and not on the SpaceX and Web, One website of triple or quadruple digit number of satellites to provide internet connectivity you were mentioning earlier, but the low latency machine to machine communication of tweet like, whether it's a soil moisture sensor in a farm or a location of a cargo, the, that uh, is a really wonderful opportunity in the space ecosystem that I would predict seeing venture capital investment in a year or two. So you all are super excited about this space. Uh, what I'm always interested in is, is the connection to science fiction. And when you start to think about, you know, we're putting satellites into orbit, we're talking about going to Mars and colonizing and, and terraforming and, and changing agriculture. I mean, it, it is really inspirational. We have about a minute 30 left. So I would love to hear, you know, what has been the piece, whether, whether fiction, nonfiction, you know, what has been like the inspiration that has most infected your investing in this category? Uh, Matt, maybe we'll, we'll start with you because I know you have a, quite a few sources. <laughs> I, 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 w I would say we're, we're driven by the, the dark and light poles of, uh, of sci-fi. Um, you know, on the one hand, Star Trek is a very optimistic vision of the future. On the other hand, Elysium is a disturbingly realistic uh, vision of the future. And you could say that... Uh, we are investing to generate a very high return for our LPs, moving the world closer to Star Trek and further away from Elysium. Uh, and the reason that we were focused on space is in a very, very rapidly changing world, you need the high ground. You need intelligence about what's going on on every square meter of the planet. And if you don't have that, the human ability to respond to bad change continues to go linearly, and bad stuff happens exponentially or even asymptotically. Uh, and as long as we can make a lot of money by improving human knowledge and capacity there, we're, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, Tessa title. I... Most impactful piece of sci-fi or, or, or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I like to say that I invest in what used to be science fiction a few years ago that is becoming a reality today. And my personal passion and goal in life is to travel to space. I've been applying to NASA's astronaut program for <laughs> years with degrees in aeronautics and astronautics with a private pilot's license. I'm still being rejected, so I don't know who I need to speak to, but uh, I hope to go as a space tourist soon. Rob, a title. I'll talk about what's Real quick, in real the title. Future, <laughs> yeah, they're going to yeah. Vulture yes. series you where you have a friendly interplay between AI and humans flying through space. Amazing. I'm so looking super forward to all of your investments. Thank you so much for the panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.